Brad's always first. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Item two, roll call. Nelson? Here. Orison? Here. Larson? Here. Wenchel? Here. Hansen? Here. Reet? Here. Moriarty? Here. Thank you. Uh, housekeeping really quick before we get to the consent agenda. Uh, so we have two public hearings tonight. Uh, item four, um, there's uh, attendance from our citizens here in town tonight. Everybody will have the opportunity if you want to, uh, to speak. And when we get to item 4B on the agenda, and if you don't have a copy, there's agendas should be out on the table out there. Uh, we'll go through the process before I actually read um, the public hearing item, just so everybody's familiar with the process that we'll go through. So thank you for being here in attendance tonight. Item three is the consent agenda. 3A is a motion to approve city council minutes of July 20, uh, 2020. There are no licenses. C is a resolution authorizing permanent transfer of funds of budgeted transfers for the month ending July 31, 2020. D is a resolution acknowledging receipt of budget amendment for fiscal year 2021 from Spencer Municipal Hospital of the City of Spencer, Iowa. E is a motion to approve Advanced Traffic Control Incorporated and Lakeside Construction Incorporated as subcontractors for the 2020 4th Avenue Southwest Trail Project. This is a DOT let project. F is a resolution authorizing and directing the temporary closing of portions of the city street in the city of Spencer <clears throat> on 1st Avenue West between 9th and 10th Street as requested by Hope Church on August 16, 2020. G is a resolution authorizing and directing the temporary closing of portions of the city street in the city of Spencer from 2nd Avenue East uh, on 2nd Avenue East from East 18th Street to East 19th Street as requested by Seth McCauley on August 22 of 2020. H is a resolution authorizing and directing the temporary closing of portions of the city alley and parking lot, which would be the north half of parking lot number three and north half of the alley between 1st Avenue East and 2nd Avenue East and East 5th Street and East 7th Street as requested by the Spencer Community Theater on August 19, 2020. I is a motion to approve uh, to authorize purchase of two new sewer jet nozzles from McQueen Equipment, Ankeny, Iowa, for $7,417.80. This is a CIP item. J is a motion to approve sewer refund for Jacobson Homes Corporation for 221 32nd Avenue West for $2,498. And the final item, K, is uh, a motion to authorize application for a REAP grant for Stolly Park Kayak Canoe Launch Project. I'd introduce that. First by George, second by Bill. Discussion or question on these items? Anyone? Hearing none, vote by machine, please. Nelson I, Orison I, Larson I, Wunchell I, Hanson I, Reet I, Moriarty I. Thank you. Item four is the public hearing. There are two, as I stated before. Um, the council has received on either public hearing, if you have submitted a written comment in favor of or a written comment against, it is in our packets tonight, and they've all had access to read that. When we get to that portion, <clears throat> if the city hall has received any comments, uh, the city clerk, Teresa Reardon, will acknowledge who submitted it. We won't read aloud um, the uh, text of the for or against. We'll just acknowledge that you uh, have submitted it. If you have a verbal comment in favor of or a verbal comment against, we'd like you to come one at a time to the podium. 
What you need to do is state your name and your address, and then you have the ability to use the podium. Uh, we would like to keep the comments to two to three minutes and uh, um, proceed from there. So, and if you have any questions during the process, you know, please ask, but that is the format that we will use. So 4A is a public hearing on plan, specification, form of contract, and estimate of cost for the construction of the 2024 Street Southeast Sidewalk Project. I declare the public hearing open. Have we received any written comments in favor? We have none. Are there any oral comments in favor? Are there any written comments against? We have none. Are there any oral comments against? I declare the public hearing closed. Item 4A1 is a resolution finally approving and confirming plans, specifications, and form of contract for the 2024 Street Southeast Sidewalk Project. First by Tom. Second by Lauren. Questions or discussion on this? Hearing none, vote by machine, please. Nelson I, Orison I, Larson I, Wunschel I, Hanson I, Reed I, Moriarty I. Thank you. Item 4A2 is a review of the bids received on July 31st, 2020 by engineer Cruz, Kate, and Nelson. Ross? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, in front of you, you should have a bid tabulation sheet for the project, uh, that bid on Friday. We received five bids. Um, we had a little bit of a wide variety of numbers, um, but in the end, uh, MLS Landscape and Design was the low bidder at $57,608.53. That was 74.3% of the engineer's estimate, which was $77,558.50. Um, I think you see a little bit of a range in numbers just because of the time of year and the amount of work that some of the contractors have and maybe don't have. So we feel like this is a, this is a really good number for this project. Um, MLS Landscape and Design did one of the Safe Routes projects down on 7th Street and 8th Street Southwest. That must have been six or seven years ago, I think. So they've done work for the DOT and they're capable of getting the work done. So, so we would recommend awarding the project to MLS Landscape and Design at their bid of $57,608.53. Hey, I have a small question, I, or one quick question I have. The, the uh, MLS, there are a few of the unit prices that seem to be significantly less than the other bids. Any concerns from the engineering standpoint? Um, I actually talked to their estimator this morning, and he seemed to be happy with their bid. Okay. So um, I think they can get the work done. They're, they're really good numbers for the city, and um, they must be confident in their bid. So. And if Mark was comfortable with that, I want to make sure that you were. Yep. No, nope. I would agree. I kind of had the same question when okay. I, after the bids. So, I think last meeting we might have had a timetable question on this. Did did uh, you any further along on that? Russ? We did because because of the letting date, we had actually opened up the project to be completed on June first, two thousand twenty-one, um, in anticipation of getting more people to bid because they had more time to do it. So um, that the completion date is still then um, that June first, two thousand twenty-one. Uh, MLS has indicated that they would like to come in and get started before too long, so they thought late summer, early fall. Definitely want to do it this year, so. Thank you, Ross. Any other questions regarding item 4A2? Item 4A3 or 4, I would entertain uh, either, well, we got a very quick discussion um, to table or award contract. I would make a motion to award the contract to MLS. Okay, Ron has made a motion to approve the contract, award. Second by Tracy. Vote by machine, please. Nelson I, Orison I, Larson I, Wunschel I, Hanson I, Reed I, Moriarty I. Thank you. Item 4A5 is a motion to approve three temporary sidewalk construction easements for the 2024 Street Southeast Sidewalk Project with Michael Bland, 419 4th Avenue Southeast, William and Ruby Nitzel, 711 4th Avenue Southeast, and Caroline Haug, 723 4th Avenue Southeast. 
First by Bill. Second. Second by Tom. Any discussion or questions on this? All right. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries. <coughs> Excuse me. Item 4B is a public hearing on rezoning proposal from Dr. Dennis Zilstra. Did I say that right? Zilstra? 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 All right, I want to get it right. To change the zoning classification of property located at 1018 North Grand Avenue from its present zoning classification of A residential to C1 general commercial uh, of the district zoning classification. I declare the public hearing open. Have we received any written comments in favor of? We have one from Dr. Dennis Zylstra, 1018 Grand Avenue. Thank you. Are there any oral comments in favor of? Okay, come on up. Just as a reminder to state your name and your address and then proceed with your comments. Try to keep her around two to three minutes. Dennis Zylstra, 1018 Grand Avenue. <clears throat> um, my concern is every property from downtown to the corner of 11th and Grand where my property is, is already zoned C1 commercial. All, every property except mine. So why wouldn't it be? And also, Mike, <coughs> Mike uh, Carlson stated that it could open up uh, commercialism. If everything is already zoned C1, everything from downtown to me, uh, what are we opening up? And my intentions are to sell my property to the hospital. And I'm sure that'll work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Is there any other comments in favor of? Okay. Are there any written comments against? We have four written comments against. We have a letter from Grand Avenue Improvement Corporation signed by Mike Carlson. We have the Grand Avenue Neighborhood Homeowners Petition. We have a letter um, from Bill Bumgarner representing Spencer Hospital. And we have a letter from Sharifa Jones, Chair of Spencer Historic Preservation Commission. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any oral comments against? Mary Jean? I'm going to do this because I'm I'm six feet away from you, right? Is this okay? <laughs> okay. I'm Mary Jean Montgomery. I live kitty corner uh, from Dr. Zilstra's, uh, the parcel that is being requested to rezone from uh, residential to commercial. Um, I have lived there with my husband for 45 years. We live in the original Bjorn Bjornstedt house. He was a pioneer. You probably recognize the name. He was the first Norwegian Bjornstedt that came to Spencer. And he built six homes. He was an extraordinary carpenter. Um, but we are in the only home that remains in Spencer. So um, the house was built, we believe, in about 1892. I'm just gonna share very briefly in two or three minutes some of the unique characteristics of this North residential neighborhood. And I'm gonna sort of loosely define it from about Hope Reform Church 9th all the way to 18th. Um, actually, Dr. Silster is incorrect. The parcels on Grand are actually all residential. It's going east are the ones he may be referring to as commercial. But let me talk about some of the unique characteristics. First of all, it's probably one of the few entryways to a small community in Iowa that remains a tree-lined residential street. I've, in fact, I don't know any others that are as beautiful in this part of uh, the neighborhood, but it's probably one of the few. And, and one might ask, how did that happen? Um, I think a lot of things. So one thing, your leadership, uh, planning and zoning, thoughtful work, uh, certainly the skilled work of your park department, um, we've been able to keep Grand Avenue um, looking stunningly beautiful, but also residential. Another important characteristic is the fact the homeowners have taken great pride. And I don't know if you've noticed recently, but there's an explosion of 
people reciting, new windows, landscaping. So there's a lot of investment back into Grand just, just within the last 12 months. Um, and finally, um, there's a, a tremendous amount of community pride. Um, it's not just the neighborhood that loves Grand Avenue, residential Grand, but it's in the, the entire community. The second characteristic that's sort of interesting is it's a linear neighborhood. You know, we think about neighborhoods, you know, being this way, but this is this kind of neighborhood. And it's, it's a much tougher neighborhood to get people together. So one of the goals of Grand Avenue Improvement Corporation in 2014 was to try to bring these folks together and work together. And that's been pretty successful. It's always a challenge though, right? Another important characteristic, and Shrifa Jones is here tonight, and she can speak much more eloquently than I can, but that it's on the National, Story, uh, it's National Register of Historic, Historic Places. I'm not going to go into detail. It's a, it's a wonderful application that you actually submitted, thank you, um, to the National Park Service, and that was in, I think, 2014. Um, something unique about that is a lot of residential neighborhoods in this country that are on the historic register are actually a one sort of architectural milieu, you know, it, Williamsburg, perhaps you've been there, or Charleston, it's sort of one cultural historic period. Grand Avenue, go from, from south to north for probably four or five, maybe even more, architectural historical periods, which is, makes Grand Avenue kind of an eclectic collection of, of really interesting houses. And the, the last unique characteristic is that it has encouraged and leveraged a lot of investment, not only into Grand, but into Spencer. Um, you're familiar with, the, excuse me, the Vision Iowa grant, which was about 2.5 million, another, another private, uh, private foundation, the Diverkson Foundation, another half a million. And then there've been lots of other uh, community partners. Your investment as a city, the park department over the years, and um, very recently, a Renaissance Initiative um, will be um, executing a project there and doing some replacement planting. So in short, I just want you tonight, I urge you as a neighbor, but also as part of the entire Grand Avenue neighborhood, as well as a, a Spencer citizen, I urge you to reaffirm the commitment that you've already made, and that is to sustain and enhance the residential and historic character of residential grand. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other oral comments against? Uh, we'll finish these up and then we, we can certainly come right back. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Dick Montgomery and I live at 1105 Grand Avenue. Uh, I just have three things that I think are very important in regard to the zoning of this property. Uh, number one is that your planning and zoning commission denied the request for rezoning, and I think that was for a very important reason. It was unanimous. I think that's important. And the reason was is there is no good reason for rezoning the property. Uh, it's not a legitimate... Uh, it's not a legitimate reason if you are only attempting to increase the value of the property by rezoning it. And that's exactly what we have in this particular case. Uh, number two, uh, rezoning uh, of the property to commercial really ends up hurting your downtown commercial area, which is now uh, a historic district as well. Uh, there's plenty of places, that's only three blocks south of where this property is or four. Uh, there's plenty of space downtown for commercial uh, entities. And at the same time, if you allow commercial to creep into the residential community, the residential area to the north, you will hurt that. So at the end of the day, you could end up with two areas uh, which are not successful. Uh, because you didn't keep them where they should have been. And finally, uh, I think a, a really important thing is that, uh, I think maybe one of the most important things is there has been a tremendous amount of investment in Grand Avenue over the last 10 years. And if I'm on, living on Grand Avenue and I'm going to put a big investment in my house, and most people, there's a lot of people doing that, and I know that 
the lot across the street can be converted to a Dollar General store because it's been rezoned to C1 commercial, I'm not going to make that investment. I, it, just, it just won't happen. And if there's been a tremendous amount of work going on in Grant and a tremendous amount of things being done. And I, I hope that that will continue, and I think it will. And I, and I think it makes it a great street. Um, and I think that it makes us a stronger community and a stronger city by keeping the center part of our town very viable for uh, housing. Any questions? If not, thank you very much. And I, I, I really want to thank you for all that you have done uh, for the city and for Grand Avenue and, and for Grand Avenue Improvement Corporation. You've done a great job, and I'd just like to see you keeping it up. Thanks. Any other oral comments against? All right, we'll do a, a quick courtesy. If, if you would like the uh, microphone again, if there was something you missed on, <clears throat> if there was something you missed on your first comments, you can you can go back up if you'd like. <clears throat> Talking about commercial, um, four properties south of Dr. Jorgensen that are commercial. I've been told if somebody bought those four properties, they could put a huge business in there, which is probably right. Mine is a very small one. Dollar General would not go in there. Nothing like that. I'm sure the hospital will be, we'll come to an agreement with them. If I don't, uh, then we'll decide something else. There will not be anything like that on that property. I know that for sure. Okay. Thank you. So some uh, procedural things per Iowa law. <clears throat> um, now that we're through the uh, comments in favor of and the comments against, uh, we under Section 414.5 of the Iowa Code, if within a 200-foot distance of a requested uh, zone change, if 20% uh, of, and there's debate whether it's 20% of the area or 20% of the property owners object to the request, um, it must have a super majority vote at the council level to vote in favor of. So uh, the law is written three fifths. For us, three fifths means six out of seven. So to summarize that up for you, if the zoning request were to be approved, it would take six affirmative votes of the seven voting members of the council. So to recap the process here, July 8th, the Planning and Zoning Commission met. Um, they have made a recommendation uh, to you that is on your cover sheet. Um, the staff has submitted a recommendation on the cover sheet as well. You've heard from the citizens in town in favor of as well as against. And so before I proceed um, entertaining or asking for a motion, I just want to make clear um, if anybody has any questions procedurally about uh, the vote and or the motion that I will ask for. Mr. Mayor, somebody might question yes, your mass. Okay. The state code is 75% or six votes. The city code uh, is actually three-fifths or five votes. But state code trumps city code in this instance. So. Everything else the mayor said is exactly right. It's going to take six votes to approve this zoning change. Sometimes we throw stuff out just to make sure Don's paying attention. <laughs> good, good catch, Don. <laughs> All right. So on your agenda, you will see under 4B, um, I will declare the public hearing closed. And now I would entertain either a motion to deny or a motion to approve the uh, zoning classification um, of the rezoning, I'm going to read it here. The proposal to change the zoning classification of property located at 1018 North Grand Avenue from its present zoning classification of A residential to C1 general commercial in the district zoning classification. Mayor, I would like to make a motion on denying the rezoning, and I'll go into that when we get a second. I'm telling my reasons behind it. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor, first by Ron to to deny the request, second by Lauren. Discussion on this item? Okay, um, I've been on the council for, uh, it must be a long time, 12, 14 years, but this, this property has come up before 
we had issues on it. Oh, well, when the Walgreens property come in. But my, but my biggest concern back then was the same thing as I have today. This is a residential area. If we rezone it to commercial to, to make for one, one person, every residential house in there will be non-conforming. So if something were to happen to those properties, once that turns over to commercial, they would not, they would have to get non, if they had a house burned down or something, you know, they would have to go into the non-conforming. Um, I feel sorry for, for Dr. Zylstra and, and, and I understand what's going on, but he's been in non-conforming for the last, as long as you've been in business. Um, but he could not, I mean, if that property built down, he could not build it back as a commercial without getting a variance. And, and, and I just have a tough time when, when people up in that area bought their houses, they understood it was residential housing up there. So I have a tough time turning to C1 commercial unless there's a, just an absolute reason. And I don't see that with this request. I, I have a quick question for counsel. Mike. I'm sorry. Quick quest, question from counsel. If Dr. Zylstra enters into an agreement with the hospital, what options do the hospital have if they were to buy it? Or do they have any options? As I recall, a, a, a parking lot would be permitted in the A residential by special exception. So that would be one option. Um, if they want more park, I guess that would be an option. Um, they couldn't use it for a medical facility. Right. Does this prohibit Dr. Zylster from selling the practice to another chiropractor to continue to practice in that building because there's two rental properties, two rental apartments, I guess I understood, in that building? Typically, a non-conforming use is, is the use of the land and not affected by the ownership. So if, if uh, there were a new owner using it in the same way without expanding or remodeling, it could continue. Okay. With no prior approval from any city? Right. Okay, thank you. Tom, did you have? Yeah, I guess my question would be that it sounds like there's an agreement to sell it to the hospital the hospital is not in favor of rezoning it. So is, I, I guess I'm thinking if we deny this, it doesn't change what will happen for you in the end, does it, doctor? I'm sure I understand what you said. Either way, the hospital is interested in buying it from you, whether it's rezoned or not, correct? I think that's right. So does, does the zoning aspect of it change the value for you? That's not the reason I'm having it. I'm, I'm ready to rezone it because everything else has been already zoned C1. I've been in agreement with the hospital since April of 2014. Okay. They have first chance to buy it. We've been in contact for six years. Okay. So, but it doesn't sound like they're going to back out if it's not changed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? I have a voting uh, clarification, Don. So we discussed the uh, supermajority as it relates to if it was going to be approved. Um, we have a motion on the, on the uh, table to deny. That would fall under normal voting parameters. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Are there any other questions? Or discussion related to this item? I'm going to move this to a vote by machine. So vote by machine, please. Nelson I, Orison I, Larson I, Wunchell I, Hanson I, Reed I, Moriarty I. The motion passes. Item five, old business, there is none. Item six, new business, 6A, is a resolution approving updated job description for the planning director. This was discussed at the personnel committee meeting on July 20th, 2020. 
First by Donovan. Second. Second by Tom. Questions or discussion on this item? George, go ahead. I am a concern about uh, allowing the person that uh, gets this um, contract to have up to 24 months to get their commercial license uh, for commercial uh, electrical. Uh, I personally think that should be 18 months. As uh, Number one, I think it um, lowers the expectations of that person to um, get qualified. I think there should be more emphasis put on that, that we need them qualified and that that would indicate that it's not that important. And uh, that's my main reason for that. And, and I also feel that I know that there's a difference in the commercial and the residential, but once you've taken the residential, you've got a pretty good handle of what's behind electrical um, code. I mean, you've got some idea of what it is. So you don't have to under, you know, study the very basics of it. You're going to understand the basics. All you have to do is you know, figure out what is the difference between the commercial and the uh, residential. So that's my reasoning for thinking that 18 months should be plenty adequate. And I'd like to recommend that we uh, move to um, amend the contract by that amount. So quick procedural question, Don. So we have a, a motion on the floor. Uh, George, I assume that's going to be a first on an amendment to that motion? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So we'll either have a second or it will die from lack of a second. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then so we would vote. If there is a second, we would vote. And if it is voted down, is the first motion still alive or do we have to? Yes. Okay. All right. Everybody clear on that? So George has made a motion to amend uh, the motion that's on the floor from a 24-month qualification to an 18-month qualification to get certified for the commercial. Uh, cert Do you want commercial and residential both? Well, yes. The, the residential is already in there 12 months. 12 months. Okay. So, so the commercial at 18 months. All right. So there's a first on the floor for that. Is there a second? Ron has made that a second. So any further discussion on the on the amendment? Okay, so we have a motion to approve the planning descript the planning director position that went out as uh, Amanda had in her packet. So there's an amendment now. All of that is the same except for we're changing the 24 month commercial certification to 18 months. Then then it goes the first motion is still on the floor to approve the uh, position. Your first vote will be on the amendment. Correct. Right now? Right now. Yep. Uh, um, you guys are running me through my paces. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I agree with the 24 months. There is a difference between residential and commercial. Um, that's saying the difference between plumbing and hydronics. Um, on, it's on the same type of end. There's, it's a lot different doing things into a house as it is in the commercial end. Um, uh, there's a lot of different code procedures that you got to go with. Uh, they're going to work pretty hard that first 12 months just to pass the residential and still try and do everything else they're doing. That I, I, I agree with the 24 months just because it's they're just now getting their feet wet while they're still trying. Yeah, they're going to try and get it earlier. We're going to would I'd say try and push them don't wait till the last day to get it done um, but there is a big difference between commercial and residential and I know there is on electrical too there's huge difference I also I'd also like to agree with Amanda's letter a little bit that went out today or email and that you know the emphasis of the emphasis of this position the electrical portion of it is important, but I agree with her in saying that we want this position to emphasize the planning director portion too and not have to crunch the first 18 months at no planning director work and all electrical. Thank you, Tom. Ron? And, and the reason I, I seconded that motion, I, the discussion isn't bad. I just kind of wanted to see where, you know, we had a first. and, and I don't have a whole lot of problem going to the 24 months, to be honest with you. Um, 
I'd like to see them get it in 18, you know, but, but if they, if, you know, 24, they're going to be pretty busy with planning director stuff. And, you know, that's kind of my thought on commercial <laughs> and Donovan is right. The commercial, it's just a lot of different materials that you use in commercial than you, I mean, wiring is, wiring is just the conduit that you, that you run it through and stuff is a lot of that and some of the heavier voltage and stuff. But um, I, I don't have a real, you know, problem with going to the 24 months. But I do, but I do understand George's concerns. I, I, I mean, I like to see the, to see that, you know, pushing them forward and, and making sure that they, they have a, a drive and a desire to get that through. I do as well. And there's nothing to say that we can't encourage, you know, move along as quickly as you can. I think we can certainly do that. Um, you know, and we might get, we might get somebody that already has most of it and it's both done in 12 months. It's hard to say, but I agree. I think that 24 months is fitting. Thank you, Tom. And yep, George, go ahead. My concern is if we wait two years and it doesn't happen, what are we going to do then? Are we going to terminate that person like we did the last one that didn't make it in 12 months for the residential? Two years is a long time to be working here to then all of a sudden say, well, you're not qualified to work here anymore. I think that's what we're, that's my concern, that we're in that, we put ourselves in that position. Well, I, I hope that, I hope we avoid that with Charlie's expertise. You know, I hope that there's some screening done ahead of time along those lines. Wouldn't you agree, Amanda? Is that, I mean? Yeah, I think that's accurate. I mean, I think George's concern is well-founded. Um, because none of us want to be in a position where two years from now, um, you know, and not to, I certainly don't want to speak about uh, previous situations, but one of the screening questions is about your ability to study and pursue these certifications outside of the workday. Um, and that, that's going to be an important component, um, which will hopefully aid in them receiving those certifications sooner uh, than later. So, and then, you know, the majority, I think why we put the emphasis on residential is that the majority of our work in town is residential from an inspection um, perspective. And also, while this is an important part of that job, it's not the entirety of that job. And we do have someone on staff who is certified to do both residential and commercial inspections currently. Um, so we aren't, we aren't lacking in that area right now. Um, which gives this individual time to to study, to learn uh, both the inspection pieces, but also then to learn the job of planning director at the same time. Um, and as I mentioned in, in my email, um, we also want to be careful, be really careful about about the job description because the job description determines what the pool of candidates look like. And do we want candidates who are geared more towards planning director who have the ability to learn the inspection process or do we want candidates who are geared more towards being building officials um, who may not have the the additional qualities to be a, a high level planning director so that that was the rationale for the recommendation and a few concerns that i think some have um, Anna's got her commercial. Mm -hmm. If something, you know, if she were gone mm -hmm. for a while, yep. the state inspector still, we still could have them during Correct. emergency like that. Mm -hmm. They would, they would inspect those commercial ones at that point. Correct. They won't completely. Have you talked to the commercial in, in that scenario? If, if we have, if we only have one person and, and she, is gone for an extended time. Yes, we have. And, which, and so the state will assume um, inspection responsibilities when we ask them to, and then they will turn those back over when we ask them to. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. That enters into another question that I would have then, that if we're indicating that, then if we didn't have that commercial in there at all for that uh, manager, that department, we would possibly be easier to hire and someone not quite as qualified or feel mm -hmm. they're quite as qualified and would maybe be a lower pay structure in the long run than, than going the, this way to have them. Um, I, I can't speak about the pay structure um, 
because this is just one component of the planning director position. And I, I think the pay structure is, is set where it's at, you know, based on, so the job description and the, the new pay plan is partially is based on what the employees themselves listed as their job duties. And um, for some inspections were part of it and for others who hadn't obtained them yet, the certifications yet. Um, you know, I, if you remember, I initially did um, make the comment that I didn't, I didn't know that commercial inspection was necessary for the planning director. Um, but through the conversation, it, it is an important role. And if they're going to manage a person who is responsible for commercial inspections, um, they, they need to know, they need to know what's going on. Um, the, the, uh, police chief has to know how to do CPR, even if he only does it once or twice a year. And so that's how we landed on keeping it in there, um, but extending the timeline to grant more time to be able to obtain that certification. Thank you, Amanda. Lauren? Yes, sir. Comment on it. I, to dovetail on Ron's comment, I think it was Ron, um, this person is going to be drinking out of a fire hose when they show up, who, regardless of what their experience level is. Um, there's going to be a lot on their plate, a lot to get uh, caught up on. Um, I do appreciate George's comment about that. Is there any way that we could tag an incentive to this so that if this person uh, gets this in 12 months, 18 months, that there might be an incentive type attached to their um, employment? I don't know. Maybe that's something you can talk to Carlson folks. Mm -hmm that's even doable um, as, as far as incentives go I think one way that you could pursue that is to offer the position at a lower step and once you obtain the certifications then you move to the next step um, we do that well our police officers they're hired uncertified and once they re receive their certification they move up um, you know we can certainly that that all gets flushed out during the actual hiring process so that's that's um right thank you lauren any other comments tracy now if the state does inspection mm -hmm. is that a timely inspection is there a waiting period longer waiting period so the state has been doing our commercial inspections since kirby left yep. and this may be a poor barometer but i have not received any any comments or complaints about the process not being timely okay so they do have a an inspector who resides in the area now i think before they were kind of all spread out maybe coming from des moines but they do have someone that lives in northwest iowa so thank you tracy all right i'm going to call the vote and just to be clear the vote is on uh, the job description with the amendment so a yes vote would mean you're trimming it back to 18 months a no vote would mean you're leaving it at 24 months. If the amendment fails, then we will go back and vote on the original motion um, after that. So vote by machine, please. <coughs> Nelson nay, Orison nay, Larson nay, Wunschel nay. Hanson nay, Reet nay, Moriarty aye. Thank you. Good discussion. And maybe we can get a hybrid type of solution um, out of that. So, And I'd like to thank everyone for their input. Thanks for writing that, George. Thank you, George. So now we are back to 6A, which is a resolution approving updated job description for planning director. We've had a first, we've had a second, we've had discussion. Is there any further discussion? All right, vote by machine, please. We have one. Oh. Nelson I, Orison I, Larson I, Wunchell I, Hanson I, Reed I, Moriarty I. Thank you. Item 6B is a resolution amending the City of Spencer personnel policy regarding the notice of injury. First by Bill. 
Second by Tom. Discussion, questions on this item? Sure. Yeah, so our um, work comp carrier um, does an audit annually, and during that audit, um, they determined that we needed to add this particular language to our personnel policy. We already have, we already do this in practice. Um, we just needed to make it official by putting it in writing. Don, isn't isn't it an OSHA rule that you have to within 24 hours get give um, or put it into the state or something? The the employee has to file a first report of injury with the city, and and the city has to keep a record. And of the all city this. has 24 hours to report right. it, right? Or <laughs> what the work comp carrier has said is, please have them call our nurse. Oh, who's, okay. Who's on the 24 hour availability? So that's all this does. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Any other discussion on this item? Hearing none, vote by machine, please. Nelson I, Orison I, Larson I, Wunchell I, Hanson I, Reed I, Moriarty I. Thank you. Item 7, department head reports. I know uh, the fire chief is on the phone. Uh, we will begin with the planning department. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I don't have a lot to report. Uh, you'll see that planning and zoning has been very busy this month, as has Board of Adjustment. There is a special Board of Adjustment meeting scheduled um, for Monday, August 10th, for a couple of rather routine matters. Um, and then planning and zoning will meet um, on the 12th uh, for a rezone request. Um, busy working on this process to get a new planning director hired. Thank you. Uh, B, library, Mandy. Good evening. Um, the library is currently open via appointment um, to 10 people. We actually expanded that to 15 today. So, um, and we will have three computers available. So. Um, you just call us to make an appointment and, um, you know, we can, you can have a 45 minute slot or an hour and 45 minute slot if you're doing things on the computer. So, um, we are working with that and it seems to be going well because we clean and sanitize between, we take appointments on the hour and then at 15 till then we clean and sanitize the library and then let the next wave in. So um, we're moving towards, you know, it seems slow to a lot of people, but um, you know, we are comfortable in moving towards, you know, fully reopening in this manner. So we're just trying to do it as safely and, and, and easily for everybody, including our staff, because it's a lot of um, extra work for our staff. So, um, which they are, I really appreciate that they've been doing. Um, so now people can come in and browse. Um, so you can come in and pick out your own books or we are still retaining the curbside service. Um, we are rapidly approaching a thousand curbside deliveries a month. Um, so we're bringing books out to people's cars a thousand times a month. Um, and uh, that's pretty impressive to us, but we've decided to retain that to aid people who you know, may feel a little more wary about getting out in the cold and snow this winter to get books and we can just bring them right to your car and you can stay nice and warm and we'll do the, we'll do the hard work. <laughs> All you guys have to do is read or watch movies. I, I, I think maybe you can handle it. Um, we are still requiring masks to enter the building for the safety of you and your, and our employees. We don't have restrooms, meeting rooms, water fountains, toys, newspapers, or seating currently available yet. So, however, what we have decided to do is um, we are continuing the activity kits for kids, teens, and adults through the start of school. Um, we were just going to do it through summer reading program that ended July 31st, but due to the popularity, um, we have decided to continue and we're hoping that maybe we'll continue and we'll do one for kids and adults once a month. Um, so 
we are doing it weekly um, for the kids and teens and every two weeks for the adults. The ones that are coming up right now, we have string art for the kids or for the teens. And uh, they are, uh, for the kids, they're doing fossils. Um, there is still Zoom story time with Sarah Beth on Tuesdays at 10 and Thursdays at 3. We are having our first book giveaway day was so successful. We go, gave away books to 200 families. Um, we are doing another one on August 18th from 12 to 6 p.m. outside the library. So you can stop in and get a book for your kid or grandkid or yourself if you're a kid. I don't know if kids are watching this, but probably not. But just in case. Um, and then we also have teen book boxes for the kid for the teens. So we give them a they give us what they like and then we put together a, a subscription box. So they get some treats and some activities and some hand-picked books. And then the adults, um, we've got a Zoom book club coming up, the Alice Network. Um, we have string art for the adults right now. And um, we have concrete planners coming up in the middle of August. And then I want to point out August the 20th from 6 to 7. We have Dr. Larry Cook, from, who's from uh, Hoover's Presidential Library, and he is presenting an evening with the presidents. So he'll be showing artifacts from various presidents and talking about them. So that's on Zoom. You can watch it at the comfort of your own home, and we won't watch, see you eating pizza or judge you. Um, so you can tune into that and look for uh, more, more details on our Facebook and or our library um, Web page at spencerlibrary.com. Do you have any questions for me? Yes. Are you at full staff and yes. books that come back? You are? Yes. Okay. When books come back, do you just leave them for a week or so? They're or do you sanitize them thoroughly? Or? They're quarantined for three days. Okay. And then they're sanitized and reshelved. Oh, so, yes. Books. Well, as best we can. That's why we quarantine them, quarantine them for three, three days. We wipe them down with a 3M Quat solution, which is what the hospitals use, um, and it kills everything. But you can't really sanitize the pages of a book, which is why we quarantine them for three days. So if your checkouts are delayed, that's why. Um, <clears throat> but yes, we do sanitize as best we can. And that's one of the hardships that libraries are facing is how do you how do you get the books out back out on the shelves as fast as you can with being while well, still being as safe as possible? Thank you. You mentioned you limit ten people in the library. Mm -hmm. Does that include if you get three people on the computer? Yes. But then there's only seven other ones that can be in. Correct. Yep. Then they all recycle every hour. Um, except the people on the computer can request an hour. Well, I mean, if you think you're going to browse for two, an hour and 45 minutes, you could request that okay. as well. But I was just curious how you... Yeah, they just cycle. Up. Yep. Uh, we have a, a very elaborate... Oh, I'm sorry. A very elaborate schedule system. Um, I know if I didn't talk with my hands, I'd be mute. Um, we have an elaborate schedule system that we've set up that has the, all the time slots for each day. And we have 15 slots and, you know, we mark if they're in for an extended session so that we don't over schedule and so. <laughs> it's uh, great to see you guys are open again, Mandy. Appreciate that. Yeah. About how many people do you think a day are coming through now? Um, well, let's see. We usually have at least, we have three to five per hour. So when we're open for eight hours a day or more. Um, so, I mean, it's usually between 40 and 50 people a day. That's so. great. We appreciate it. And yeah. And then oh, the curbside, we're in and out of that door all the time. Right. I'm surprised the library isn't full of flies as much as that <laughs> door opens. So. Well, thanks for everything that you guys have done. Yeah. Well, um, oh, Donovan, sure. go ahead. I, I noticed... Uh, you got three computers up. Are those the new computers we just got? Are they? Um, the are new you computers. Rotating the computers. The new computers used are used for for staff. Okay. So the old staff computers, some of them, if they can be rotated into the patron area, we use them. But 
otherwise we have a computer budget that we buy patron computers with. Okay. So we basically use the computers the city gives us as for staff, just like all the other departments. So we don't use them for patrons. All right, thank you, Mandy. Fire Department, Chief Kanye. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Manager. Over the past month of July, your fire department answered 44 calls for service, which uh, breaks down to 15 fire calls, including a couple of gas leaks, basement fire, burnt food, and a couple of water flow alarms. We also answered some EMS calls that included, uh, again, some diabetic reactions, a uh, couple of uh, people with ETOH, as well as some seizures and some slips and trips. Our personal ambulance 104 answered two calls this uh, month with uh, you know fainting as well as the removal of a taser barge. A little bit interesting there. Uh, trainings included eight trainings, uh, anything from ventilation, uh, roof work, uh, hydrant ops, basement ops, first, second floor, as well as uh, ladder uh, work, anywhere from uh, 75 feet up to uh, 10 feet up, really pretty good. Uh, we had a couple of special duty calls uh, for improving uh, the green bin prop, as well as uh, doing a couple of special investigations for uh, CO investigations, as well as the Clay County races. And in the last weekend, we hosted a Firefighter 1 test. Uh, currently, uh, we've gotten the results out of uh, two Spencer firefighters. One did get a results back and she has passed, which is uh, very good. Great stick to it, isn't it? Uh, we had a couple of car accidents. We did have one mutual aid run with uh, Royal for a house fire. And lastly, we'd like to uh, just sing again the praises of Randy Swanson, our 38-year wet veteran, having his swan song uh, just last weekend. And that's what we have today for you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chief. Any questions for the Chief? Police Department, Chief Warburton. Good evening. Uh, not a lot to report here for the month of July. Uh, the Police Department responded to 1,167 calls for service, and we performed 28 arrests. Uh, update you here on a couple of things. Um, last year, if you remember last December, we ordered our patrol vehicles. Um, I just got word here that they should be built in the month of August uh, due to the COVID uh, crisis. So uh, we hope to take possession in September, October. Uh, but in an effort to stay uh, on schedule with our patrol vehicles, uh, we'll be, uh, we sent out uh, bids uh, last week for the new patrol vehicles this year. So uh, lastly here, uh, Saturday, the police department held their drug prevention 5K run um, virtually. Um, so uh, participants were to um, send in their photos of them running or doing whatever activity they needed uh, to the police department. We uploaded that to our Facebook account. So uh, we had approximately 120 participants, which is about right on the uh, nail here what we had last year. So it was all successful. So shout out goes to my son. He beat me by about five seconds. So <laughs> I had him in the last lap, but he, he held on. So. So, so do you run like a teenager or he runs like a uh, 40 uh, plus? Yeah, exactly. He probably runs a little slower. He said he hasn't conditioned all this year, so I felt pretty bad when he beat me. So, but... Uh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. Any other questions? How are they working that? I mean, are we? They're down. Um, they're not accepting a lot of uh, people out there. You have to be uh, a dangerous or a mandatory arrest type of situation before they'll accept okay, them. That so there's going to be a backlog at some point um, that uh, when we finally do open things back up, you're going to see a lot more of these arrests. I mean, we're typically at probably 50 to 60 arrests per month, and we're only at 28 this month. So if that tells you anything, there's right. going to be there's going to be some. Uh, definitely uh, numbers that are going to grow. All right. Yep. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Chief. E, Public Works. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we did receive the mosquito sprayer already that we approved at the last council meeting, gone through training. Uh, it's been calibrated. 
Uh, the only glitch is that it is with the white dry conditions we've had, we haven't sprayed the last two weeks. So as soon as, uh, as, soon as we're able to go, we'll go with that again. Uh, of course, Street Division's been working on potholes, installing signage, sewer work. Uh, you notice we cleaned the ditch bottom at the bot and like along Burger King and uh, Don Pearson during dry conditions. You don't always get the opportunity to get in there, so they're able to go through there with a the bobcat and then uh, catch it back out, load out with a backhoe into the trucks. There was five loads of uh, silt that was silted in the bottom of there, so that's surprising. Um, been working on some alley patches and the transfer station we're reviewing the hours right now taking a look at that operation also we're taking applications for a solid waste worker so you'll see that on our social media as well as advertised in the normal areas at the landfill that uh, pesky little fire that we've had a couple times did flare up again on Friday a little bit not near what the situation was before um, we did uh, take different measures this time and and piled a lot or copious amounts of clay on it and sealed it off. So we believe that that should, should improve that. Um, it would be a good time uh, to tour the landfill for the, for the council to see the, the open cell. And we'll just have to see what your comfort level is and uh, social distancing in a, in a bus or not. It's up to you folks if you choose to do that. But it's kind of an interesting stage right now during construction. Uh, it's a, certainly a big hole that's in the ground right now. That's uh, yeah, probably was. I, I don't remember, Bill, if that was under construction too at that time or not. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of material gets moved. So, um, with that, any questions for anybody this evening? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. F. Park and Recreation, Jared. Good evening. I um, just wanted to remind everybody the Aquatic Center's last day is August 16th, and then starting August 9th um, through the 16th, the hours will be noon to 5 instead of noon to 8. So um, we continue to work on um, some trail maintenance um, with the help of the street department. Um, we put some riprap. We've had some trees fall into the river down in uh, West Leach, um, so we have tried to shore up that bank. It's getting kind of close to... Um, the trail there so with the help of them they we were able to get some uh, crushed concrete in there um, and rip wrap continue to work on um, tree maintenance as well um, trimming trees in the parks um, we'll use our city contractor for trees to remove any dead ones you might find a, a few dead ones out in the city parks but those are on our list to to remove this year as well so um we're going to be applying for that REAP grant um, that you all approved on the consent agenda to try to redo and enhance the kayak and canoe access out there at, at Stolly by the dock. Um, we've had a lot more interest in, in kayak and canoeing here um, with, with COVID, um, and we'll continue to look at river access um, as well here um, coming up in the next um, couple months to try to put in a grant to to redo the boat ramp at, at West Leach Park as well to, to try to increase use and enhance those river areas as well. So um, the master park plan, um, we'll be talking about that on August 17th in a committee meeting um, to kind of go over that draft. Um, you'll see some things in there that we may start want to think about um, pursuing in the future. So um, keep that in mind. And then lastly, um, we have hired and offered a position for the new Parks and Rec technician to uh, Bo Hoppy. Um, he's a Spencer native. Um, he's got 10 plus, experience, 10 plus years experience in the County Conservation Board system. Um, he's currently working for Story County Conservation down in Ames. Um, so he's uh, well skilled, fit in well with the rest of the staff, um, and he'll be a really good addition, and he starts August 17th. So. Jared, I had a, a citizen contact me today. Apparently, um, they were riding bikes from the bridge uh, by the aquatic center okay. towards the high school, and there were some limbs hanging down. I think they had to dodge or, you know, might have been hit. Or, yep, so we've spent a lot of time here in the last month trying to correct as many of those as we can, so thanks for bringing that up. But yeah, no problem. Yep. Could be. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Um, the pool attendance has been, you know, obviously it's not what it's what it typically has in a normal year. Um, <laughs> on good days, we see um, right around that hundred person, hundred occupant uh, number. Um, today it was cold and, and cloudy, and I think we had ten people all day. So um, <laughs> it it really is weather dependent, but um, we have seen uh, quite a bit for. The circumstances that we're under, um, and so I think it's been it's been pretty good. So uh, that I haven't seen the numbers um, on how many registered and, and for that, but <laughs> yep, that is done. They ended last week. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. They will. Yep. So. Yeah, I'm. Hopefully, we can get that grant. Yeah, I hope so too, and it's, and hopefully it uh, it'll get funded for the the full amount because we don't have to have any match. But if if we don't get the full amount, um, you know that'll be something that we look at for another CIP. If you get awarded the grant, you have two years to complete that, so we can we can take a look at other avenues on you know, either getting support from from the citizens or if we um, budget that into the CIP. Yeah, as well, I'd so. like to see a another boat ramp going into the river at Stolly's. Yeah, so our thought is, you know, kind of do one there at Stolly's by the dock and then potentially make an area, you know, clear out an area for trees and make that just kind of a more primitive um, access with still, you'll have the road right there. You won't have to go very far, but it still feels more primitive. So, yeah. Very good. All right. Thank you, Jared. All right. Thank you. Golf course, Brian. Good evening, everyone. Um, I should not have arrived late. I didn't realize I was sitting right behind the camera. My phone <laughs> has been buzzing like crazy. Apparently, the mask is hiding the enthusiasm that I have behind it. Um, we did have a golf board meeting earlier tonight. Um, I won't go over a lot of details with you guys. Most of the information was in the update that I sent you on Sunday morning. I'd encourage any of the people out there that are interested in what's going on at the golf course, they can visit our website, go to our blog. All of that information is uh, included on there as well. Same thing that the Golf Board Council and other individuals receive through email, so they can follow up uh, that way. Um, one area that I'd like to touch, touch on a little bit is irrigation. Um, people are kind of surprised that you go through a process with the Iowa DNR to receive a permit, and the DNR regulates how much water you're allowed to put down on the golf course from April 1st until the end of October. Um, the last few years, we haven't had to worry about it too much because we've had so much rain. We haven't really irrigated that much. Uh, we also have a well that we pump into our pond when the tile's not filling it, and we're also regulated to how much water we can pump out of that well. Um, so it's kind of uh, a scary thought to think about the month of July. We used one-third of our water permit to pump water from our well into our pond, and we used one-fourth of our water permit to irrigate the golf course. So uh, that's a lot of water. Um, one night of irrigation is over 450,000 gallons of water. Um, so hopefully we get a little bit of rain. And we're not uh, we're not really cutting it to the end, but uh, if we start getting closer to the end of the fall, and people are wondering why we're not watering certain areas of the golf course, it's because that we are under a water permit with the DNR, so we have to use that as widely as possible. So uh, the golf board wanted me to share that with with everyone out there this evening. So Any there's questions? No, there's no cushion there at all. Once you run out, you're out. Um, you are allowed an option to file for an extension. Sometimes that will be granted, sometimes it won't be. It just depends. Uh, I don't believe that we've been under any water restrictions this year. In the past, we've had years where we've not allowed uh, citizens to irrigate their lawns, so we're not there. So I think we're doing okay so far, but hopefully it doesn't come down to needing to, to ask for an extension. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Uh, H, city attorney, Don. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, our office was fairly active in the month of July, but nothing uh, particularly exciting or unusual. Um, still no real court activity. Nothing that I thought was worth your time in an extensive report. So I had the idea, well, I'll, I'll report to them on the actions of the Iowa legislature this session. I'm not going to do that either because even though they missed 10 weeks, they passed 120 bills that were approved by the governor. I would guess something like 800 pages of legislation in this shortened year. Um, I, if, if any of you have interest in particular bills, we can certainly provide information about that. The, the, the media has highlighted only a half a dozen bills, but as I say, there were 120. Um, it highlights the question when the lawyers asked what the law is. Well, <laughs> it's going to take a while to find out because they probably changed it last year. Uh, so if any of you have any interest in particular legislation, let me know. Is your recommendation to extend the period so they can pass less laws? Uh, I always asked Senator Holt, a friend of mine who served for many years, if he would just go down there and not hurt us, I'd be happy. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Any other questions for Don? All right, engineer Ross. All right, good evening again. Uh, quick construction update. Over at the landfill, the new cell is complete. Um, final test results are in, and Jim's working on the final report. Um, he'll be filing uh, for authorization through the DNR to put that cell into use before too long here. Um, he did say that the contractor is currently working on the new access road um, around the, the future cells. Um, they're working on grading and surfacing that road right now. So that project's almost complete. Uh, on the 4th Avenue Southwest Trail project, uh, the DOT has finally approved contracts after you guys approved them last or the last meeting. Um, so we've been able to have uh, conversations with the contractor now. We've set up a pre-construction meeting for August 11th. And I think we'll learn more about their schedule at that meeting. Um, last I heard, they were still kind of shooting for the middle to end of August to get started. And that may be the beginning of September also. So it's kind of hard to tell until we have that meeting for sure. Um, down on that project, the residents will be receiving a postcard from SMU um, to build the trail. The street lights uh, will be temporarily taken out of service down there. Um, but they will be going back in once the trail's been installed. So. Um, it's just short of a mile. It's about 0.8 miles, I believe. So it goes from uh, 13th Street down to 25th Street. So. And then a few other projects, uh, maintenance projects, I anticipate getting started the next couple weeks would be the Seal Co. project, um, the crack and joint ceiling project, and then I believe Corey Jurgens will be back to finish up the intake repairs that are left on his project. So you'll see uh, lots of action happening in a hurry. So. Give those guys some room out on the streets if you see them working. So, any questions? Question on the one in the field. Is that the last cell on the north on that? And where are we going to move to? Will we move up front or will we? Yeah, so that's, so that's the last cell on the east side of the property. Um, and then um, I'd have to double check, but I believe the new cells will start towards the road then. And that's that's the reason why the future or the new road is being built around those future cells. So, any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ross. Item nine: City Manager's Report. Amanda. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Planning Director position will be posted tomorrow. Resumes will be due to Heather Barber on August 25th. So, as we move through that process, I'll keep you all um, posted on how that that goes. Um, I did receive a bit of exciting news this afternoon from the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, on behalf of the city, the Clay County, Clay County Heritage Museum applied um, for the Cultural Entertainment District designation, and we were awarded that. So um, Spencer was one of the first communities that was awarded that designation um, well over 10 years ago. We learned last year that that designation expires after 10 years, and so we've, we are now um, recertified for that. So we, we are allowed to use that designation as a, as a promotional tool um, for the next 10 years. So I thank Braden and Stephanie for their work on submitting that application. And as we get a formal announcement um, from Department of Cultural Affairs, I'll certainly share that out. 
I might also like to thank Brian for the very informative uh, Budget 101 session that we had last week. Um, I've been spinning my wheels thinking about budgets ever since then. Maybe not ever since then, but quite a bit. Which leads me to my next point, uh, and something that Donovan has uh, commented on numerous times, when are we getting to the good stuff? <laughs> and so we need to reschedule or schedule a time to finish our strategic planning. Um, so we probably have about three to four hours worth of work to do. I promise not to go over that, um, but be looking for an email tomorrow um, with some dates uh, where we can come together and, and finish that work. Um, I think it's important that we get that done now as we move further into budget season, and if there are big things that the council wants to tackle that comes out of our planning, um, we can budget for it appropriately. Um, lastly, um, last week we held our onboarding sessions for all of our board and commission members. We had 67 people RSVP and we had uh, 62 actually attend. So I think that was a pretty good uh, rate of return. And I just wanna thank everyone who took the time to attend a session, uh, both staff and council and, and our board and commission members um, and learn a little bit more about, about those roles. Um, as we continue on with our goal setting and setting um, you know, our big plans, those individuals are gonna be far more engaged in, in uh, making those a reality than they probably have been in the past. So thank you for everyone who participated in that. And with that, I will entertain any questions you might have. Oh, well, the five, they couldn't make it. We had a family situation. I couldn't be there, so. Any other questions for Amanda? Thank you very much. <laughs> Item 10, Mayor's Report, a couple items. I would echo Chief's comments about uh, Randy Swanson. Thank you for your 38 years of service to the fire department. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot, of, a lot of things in your time, and your service is appreciated. I'd like to express appreciation to the school leadership team, uh, the board, as well as everybody that's been involved in the decisions that they've had to make in their return to uh, learn planning. Uh, it's going to be a different start, probably, you know, well, definitely a different start to a school year than any of us have experienced in our lifetimes. And so just uh, I know it's taken a lot of time and appreciate all the effort that they've put in to keep everybody safe. Uh, we've seen two events, as Amanda had talked about, uh, the budget 101 that Brian put on and the committee and board trainings that Amanda put on. I would like to comment that um, it's, it's as an elected official, it's very appreciative to see staff that is flexible and that meets the needs of things when they come up. So this was a need that we had as a council to review the budget process and it was a need as the Amanda brought up the citizen component of, a, of a government to the, those on committees and boards. I know when I served on the civil service commission for probably over 10 or 10 or 12 years, um, a lot of that business never hit the council. And so it was a good reminder for me that there's a lot of city government that happens that we don't see. And it's not done by staff, it's done with staff and uh, appointed citizens. And so thank you for putting those sessions on. Had the opportunity on Saturday to speak uh, with some other speakers at the Alpha Battery One 194th Field Artillery Deployment. Um, Congressman Steve King was there. Uh, Tim Brinkley was the guest speaker. Uh, Tim's a veteran here in town, shared his experiences in the military during uh, Vietnam. And I would just like to express our gratitude and appreciation uh, for having that in Spencer. We wish them the best during their de deployment. I would encourage the council, um, I'd like to do maybe one or two care packages uh, that we could send to them um, on behalf of the city during their deployment. Uh, I'd like to just say that out loud so we don't forget that, but I, I think we can send, send them some letters or words of encouragement or where, whatever that may be as a, a city council. The message that I gave them um, that I will relay is our state motto um, is our liberty we prize and our rights we will maintain um, I told them that our commitment as uh, elected leaders in town was that while they're fighting for our liberties, uh, that we do not take for granted the rights that we will maintain because of their service. So I just wanted to pass that on. And the final thing that I would say is, as it relates to, to COVID-19, um, I would call on the citizens to have some uh, respect, compassion, and civility as it relates to your viewpoints on this pandemic. Um, there's a certainly a 
polarized, very wide spectrum of how people are treating COVID-19 and how they treat their uh, fellow people who don't necessarily agree with their stances. And we all have an opinion. We're all entitled to our opinion. This is the United States. We have that First Amendment right. But I would just really encourage everyone to uh, take it in a respectful and civil manner. And uh, one way or another, this pandemic is going to get over. And uh, I'd certainly look forward to that. So with that, uh, I would entertain any questions you might have. Hearing none, item 11, Council and Committee reports. We have a Parks, Recreation, and Culture Committee scheduled for August 17th at 5.30 p.m. to review the draft master park plan. We have a regular City Council meeting that same night at 6.30 p.m. And we would like to schedule a Public Works Committee for Monday, August 10th at 5.30 p.m. Thank you, Amanda. Item 12, I would entertain a motion to approve the bills and claims. First by Bill. Second by George. Lauren, second by Lauren. Any discussion? Just want to bring to the council's attention there is two additional claims in front of you for two mowers for the parks department. We have a first, we have a second. Any discussion related to these items? Yeah, they were approved for purchase. It's the same report I've always run. Um, I do. I will look into the, how they have termed those two things because it's a it's a standard report. So I don't I don't know how they do their summary. I I, right. All right, any other discussion or questions related to this item? <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Item 13, other opportunity to address the council? Would anyone like the floor? No, everybody's listened out, talked out. All right. You could have had some good stuff right there, Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> Item 14, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. First by Lauren. Second by Tracy. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Have a great evening. Good job.